Okay, well, hello everybody. Thank you very much for joining us on what's turning out to be a beautiful spring afternoon and taking a few hours out on your day to attend this Suits and Boots Conference on Saving Canada's Resource Sector. My name is Corey Morgan. I'm the new Executive Director of Suits and Boots. I've been on for a couple of months now and, and it's been such a great organization that's done a lot in the past to stand up for our industries. Uh, the pandemic, like with everything else, has knocked so many things down. So it, things have been quiet on our activist front and, and we're getting ready to get rolling again because we're in such a, a turning point period right now. The world's trying to recover from the pandemic. Energy demand is rising, yet here we are shutting ourselves in. We're still embattled. We're sitting on some of the best resources on earth and we can't get them to market. We're going to be left behind and it's just ridiculous when we're, we're suffering economically sitting on these resources and, and our country is importing products that we can produce right here. Meanwhile, Line 5 is under threat, Trans Mountain. Elizabeth May was talking the other day literally about putting bills forward in Parliament to shut down our oil and gas sector. Uh, it, it, it's real. There, there is a movement to shut Canada in and we really have only a little bit of time left to, to push back and save it. So there's a number of groups a number of presenters who are working, trying to save our industry, make the most of it, make sure our next generation can enjoy the prosperity we've gotten out of this industry from this last 50, 60 years. Uh, this conference, by the way, is also sponsored by Michael Binion with the Modern Miracle Network. Uh, Michael uh, was going, uh, th that organization has done a lot in getting groups together and really promoting and again pr working on protecting our, our energy sector and our resource sector in general. Uh, it turns out due to an unexpected circumstance, Michael might not be able to join us at the end, but Danielle Smith is going to fill that time even further and everybody likes listening to a lot of Danielle. So this is going to be interactive. I mean, I, I wish it was like the old days. I could have booked a conference hall. We'd all be there together. We'd have a lobby. We'd have some snacks and, and really be able to, uh, to get together on this. Uh, this is a virtual conference, but there is a chat window on your right. Uh, you might have to push a button to open it up. The presenting uh, list of people, we got some fantastic ones coming today. Uh, it is tight, though. We're packing a whole lot in. But if we've got a gap at the end, we're more than happy to have the presenters answer some, answer some direct questions from you and interact with you. Uh, for those who have to leave early, eventually we will be putting this content out and sharing it with people, you know, the, the recorded uh, aspects of it. So uh, hopefully it's going to be a, a really productive day. We've, we've got uh, uh, people presenting on things. Uh, Dan McTeague, who's talking about the consumer aspects of things. We've got Pierre Polyev, uh, who's going to talk about the federal government role in protecting our industry. Uh, Drew Barnes on the provincial aspect of it. Uh, Jeff Calloway is going to speak on uh, getting our uh, product to Tidewater with a different prospect, uh, going out to Hudson's Bay, perhaps. So I'm going to start first and, and hand this off to Rick Grafton. Now, Rick is the chair of Suits and Boots. Uh, he was the former executive director. He's, he's been in the investment end of the energy industry for over 40 years now. And he's going to talk about the finance aspect, the divest, divestment movement. I mean, another area where activists are pushing and shutting us down is actually choking off the funding. If we can't get capital, we can't develop what we have. So, I mean, even if the pipelines get through, if we're an investment pariah, nobody's going to be able to build anything to put in those pipelines. So it, it's an important area to, to, to talk about. And uh, uh, Rick was uh, one of the founders of uh, First Energy, uh, which was, a, of course, a capital group, which was integral in, in uh, the Western Canada's energy sector and, and with uh, Peterson Company. So Rick's going to speak a while on those uh, fiscal aspects and the importance on what we have to do to keep our resource sector running and uh, where we're going to go from there. So I'll hand it over to you, Rick, and uh, thank you very much for dedicating the time, and thanks again to everybody else for tuning in. Uh, no problem. Thank you very much, Corey. We uh, appreciate everything you're doing. I think you're getting suits and boots on, on the right track, and that's fantastic. Uh, so I think we have a great afternoon for everyone, uh, Danielle, Drew, Pierre, and others, uh, and we're going to touch on a, a lot of information. Uh, so I'm going to start it off, uh, with uh, saying two dirty words, uh, money and energy. It's interesting, these two words have a, a, a lot in common. Uh, we, we, need, we need them both. And we need a lot of both of them. And so I want to frame it first for everyone. Um, 
when we talk about the energy business. Uh, the world uses 100 million barrels a day, uh, and, and currently that demand is growing. That number is going to grow over 25 million barrels a day additional to that 100 million over the next decade. Um, Warren Buffett, uh, the famous investor, said this week that we'll be using fossil fuels and hydrocarbons until his 200th birthday, and uh, he's currently 90. The growth in demand is going to continue. It's primarily coming from Asia, India, Africa, and the Middle East. Um, these people want and deserve a middle-class lifestyle. And that's what we in North America have enjoyed. Um, we have that lifestyle primarily because we've had access to cheap energy, coal, oil, natural gas, and also new nuclear, which we don't have time to talk about that today, but that is actually going to, is, a, is another topic that we, we probably will uh, talk about it in future conferences. Um, so I want to also frame where we sit on the global basis, in the global picture. Uh, Canada currently produces 5 million barrels a day. It produces 15 BCF of natural gas, it's equivalent to another 1.5 million barrels of oil. That puts us in the top 10 uh, in the world. And we have the reserves to be in the top three in the world. Now, the important issue here is that we are the cleanest producer of hydrocarbons in the world. We, and we improve every year. In the next decade, we will be the leader in the production of clean hydrocarbons. And the question that we need to ask us is why is the federal government putting so many regulations and restrictions on our resource industry? And this is across Western Canada. What is their agenda? Is this policy decisions that have come out of the UN? Or do they feel that the industry is a threat to their political power in the East? The pressure they're getting from climate change and environmental activists are primarily coming from Americans or foreign capital. And they have their own agenda. <clears throat> that agenda is not to help the Canadian energy business. <clears throat> now, I'm I want to state now that I, I'm not a climate change denier. <laughs> My career is being surrounded by geologists, and they were the original climate change scientists. Yes, climate's changing, but we will address that as well at a later date. The Canadian energy business should not be crippled by UN policies or environmental activists that are funded by foreign capital. So we need to support that and the federal government needs to support it and all of the other provincial premiers need to support it. This too is a, is a broad discussion I hope Pierre and Drew touch on. Free trade among the provinces is, our, is as critical as free trade among North America. Now the second dirty word that I mentioned at the beginning is money. Um, I've been responsible for financing the independent industry, energy industry since 1980. Time flies. The great companies that have been started over the last 40 years, they've created jobs, they've funded charities, they've created individual wealth all through our province and through Canada. And right now, where do we stand? Well, the last time I had a meeting with one of the largest private equity firms in the world, they said Canada is uninvestable. Now that is a shocking statement coming from someone that's in touch with all the large pools of capital, the pension plans. CPP, our own pension plan, doesn't invest in Canadian energy anymore. 
it's a minuscule amount. Why have they stopped flowing money into our clean energy business? You need to ask yourself that question. Well, there's two reasons. One is because of federal government policies. Two, and most importantly, is they do not see the Canadian resource industry as a place where they can get a return on their capital. This capital is pension fund money and, and it needs a rate of return. When I started in the business, you know, I always, and I dealt with global investors, they always said, money is like water and it will flow and it will flow quickly to where they can see a rate of return. And over the last six years, the money has flown out of Canada and particularly out of the resource business. Now, the reason that this is critical for everyone, that money is like the equity in one's home. And if you don't have any equity in your home, the only way to finance homes is through debt. And that is a big concern of mine. On a global basis, we are becoming a debtor nation. And I think that's easy for everyone to understand. Too much debt is never a good thing. And we need to attract foreign global capital. That capital builds infrastructures. It helps the healthcare industry. It helps social programs. This is what we need so our, the future generations can have all of these things, all the things that we've had over the last 30 years. Now, on a bright note, and the brighter note is that Alberta is about to enter and to be part of an energy super cycle. This is a type uh, quoted, I quote Robert Tran of RBC, and he said, this is gonna be the first time that we've seen supply is below demand. And when that happens, because of the lack of capital that has happened to the energy business in the last six years, you get significantly higher prices. And Alberta will generate billions of dollars for our province. In 2021 alone, cash flows will grow from 70 billion last year to 105 to 110 billion this year. We in Western Canada, this is what's critical, need to fight for better terms, in confederation. We don't want to leave confederation. That's not what this discussion is about. But it's about getting fairer equalization, fairer uh, control of our taxes, control of our own pension plan, control of our own police. I think a lot of us in Western Canada feel that we want independence. We're all grown up now. We, like Quebec, feel we are a distinct society. We, in the Western Canadian resource business, need capital for better infrastructure, to keep up with future technologies, to bring better social programs, better healthcare programs for our provinces. And all of this takes money, and that means we need to make the resource business attractive for money to flow back in. So we need better federal reg regulations, better provincial regulations that are not restricting the growth of production. When you look at companies in America, Apple, Amazon, Costco, Walmart, all of those have products that have unlimited an amount of abilities to grow. They're not restricted. And they generate a tremendous amount of top line revenue, bottom line revenue, and taxes for the states they're in, the provinces they're in, and the countries they're in. And we need to provide an attractive rate of return for global investors so that money can come back in. And currently, the policies that the federal government has is restricting our ability to maximize the rates of return of our resource business. And that, that Corey, is what we need to fix 
if we want, and this is important to every man, woman, and child in Canada and across Canada, but we're in very dire, dire situations. And uh, I hope our panel can, I hope this can start the discussion with our panel and, and what we can do. So that's it. That's it for me. And um, I, I'm looking for, I know we're going to see higher prices. And I just hope that we have the ability uh, to maximize the profits that, and, and the taxes that will come from that. So, Corey, that's it for me. Are there any questions? I'm glad to ask for any questions. I've yeah, and then while, while you're here for questions, uh, one of the things I wanted to ask about, because uh, the, the push they've talked about when they're really attacking our, our capital markets and our funding uh, for our resource sector and things such as that is divestment, and they're, they're pushing companies to sort of bail out of the industry, unfortunately, and, and it's been terribly harmful. Another area that they've really hit, though, is insurance companies. It, it, a lot of our... Uh, projects and companies and such can't get insurers to cover them anymore, which again is crippling them. Uh, what, what do you think could be done or are there alternative large insurers out there or things like that? Because it's been one of the big uh, hindrances to, to raising capital lately as well. Yeah, well, again, uh, this comes back to the policies and where do these policies come from? Um, and the federal government um, lays out policies it causes the banks to want to pull out of our energy business, which they, they have done over the last six years. And the insurance companies get very nervous when they see an industry that is not supported by the banking industry, is not supported by the capital markets. And uh, so that's, and there's been some legislation regarding abandonment liabilities that, um, have made it very uncomfortable for these industries to to do that. I I, I frankly feel uh, in Western Canada, particularly in Alberta, uh, we need bigger financial institutions to be here. We need a big insurance company to have its head office here. We need the banks to move capital here. We need big investment banks like Morgan Stanley. Goldman Sachs to have, have their offices here. And that will come if we get our pension plan here. Um, so we need these insurance companies to have their head offices here so they understand the, that their dollars are not at risk as they think they are when they just listen to foreign UN policies, federal policies, um, and they don't understand the industry. They need to understand the industry better that they're investing in. Well, and we, we've certainly got uh, no shortage of office space in Calgary these days, unfortunately. It, it, it's quite a gap. Um, something well, Corey, on, Corey, on that note, so I was here in 1983, and the same thing happened when the last Trudeau was here. Um, and that was a, a, a great, and, and this is going to happen again. That office space will be filled up because the pricing is very attractive right now. And I, and I know that the uh, people at um, the city of Calgary and the province are, are lobbying major corporations to be here. And I hope those corporations are insurance companies, banks, financial companies, uh, as well as technology and diversified companies. But I think that'll come. Well, that's good. I mean, that's that's what I want to examine a little is how can we turn this crisis into potential opportunity? I mean, they, they're empty right now, but that also means we've got some infrastructure with, with modern uh, upgrades to it. I mean, there's some beautiful buildings down there. It's a beautiful city. We've still got a, a large number of our skilled workforce uh, here in Calgary, more ready and raring to go uh to, to get things going so that could be an aspect you know in bringing in the, the as you said insurance companies and, and different things and, and looking outside of that box on on how to uh correct our industry an area that i it's dicey i guess you could say you had mentioned because again the, the capital is integral and we're having difficulty to a degree rounding it up you mentioned the cpp isn't even investing as, as much into uh western canadian resource development as it used to but government dollars getting into uh 
private industry. I mean, we saw with the uh, provincial investment into the Keystone XL pipeline, that didn't end necessarily very well. Uh, what, what aspects perhaps in government financing do you think there should be, if any, uh, loan guarantees, direct investment, no investment? Uh, where, where do you feel there? Uh, I, I really um, go back to the base. I don't want government to invest because it brings too many strings with it that that uh, are misguided. Uh, it gets back to what I talked about. Money needs to see a way it can get a return. And it wants that the when they come in, that they don't have a long list of regulations that they have to fulfill, that a lot of those regulations don't understand what the business needs to make a profit. I don't think that people in general feel that it's evil that money makes a profit. I, I when I look back to all the charities at First Energy, a small uh, investment firm, relatively, you know, we donated over two hundred million dollars to charity, and so our government. Their role should not be to uh, invest more in the energy. It's to provide regulations so the energy business can uh, prosper. Uh, uh, I know that the Kenny government has done things with the AER. Uh, I know Scott Moe's uh, government has the regula regulatory bodies in Saskatchewan are easy to deal with. And we need that across the provinces and we need access to tide water for our natural gas and our oil. And I, and I hope that's coming, but they've got to get out of the way and not be a blockade for us. So I'm, I'm not for them spending more capital. It, um, that's the role of private, of private capital and these big private equity firms around the world. Yeah, and I, I understand and agree. That's something I've always long said. I mean, sometimes you see people, the uh, defenders of the federal government, you know, people say, what have you done for me lately? And they say, well, they bought you a pipeline. Well, we didn't want them to buy a pipeline. We just needed them to get out of the way. I mean, there was already private money willing to build the Trans Mountain Line. Energy East right. was ready to go. TC Energy wanted Correct. to do it, but they regulated it to death. Um, Correct. So, so as Bill uh, durrell has been pointing out too, uh, if we shut this stuff down, does anybody you say, have any idea what the government sees to replace this revenue from energy dollars? I don't think they have a plan, but is there something hidden uh, that you can see that the federal government can do to uh, make up for these lost dollars if they keep killing our, our Western resource industries? Well, Pierre knows better than me, but I, I, the Canadian resource, the Western Canadian resource industries are leaders in their field. We are the number one industry in Canada by so many uh, metrics, you know, by, but by revenue and the size of our industry, you do not replace the number one industry in your country by putting restrictions on it. And as you can see in the pharmaceutical business, we, we have exported that doesn't exist in Canada. The manufacturing, the automobile business it is not in Canada. So we're the number one business in Canada, and you just don't replace it with wind and solar. They're part of the, they're part of the equation, but they are not, they will never be a leader in, in the country. Jobs that, and you talk to Rex Murphy, the jobs that Alberta and Western Canada, the energy business produce help everybody. And it helps the manufacturing industry, the small manufacturing business, business all through Ontario. It helps the labor market all across the country. You, there is no, there's no replacement for this business. Five million barrels a day, 15 BCF of gas. There's no replacement for it. Yeah, and as uh, I see Mary Ellen uh, had pointed out as well, all she can see is talk about a wealth tax. And a, a wealth tax really means very little if nobody's got the wealth to take from. I mean, Venezuela, they, they had uh, no shortage of resources, but uh, they, they couldn't pay their bills and their people were literally uh, eating zoo animals. So thank you very much, Rick, for, for that presentation. And, and part of what you left off on was it was an, uh, 
uh, getting our product to Tidewater, which Jeff will be addressing right away. Was there anything else you'd like to add before uh, I move on? Uh, no, I, I, but we're going to make people very jealous across Canada because the Alberta energy business is going to generate a tremendous amount of revenue and uh, tax dollars. And um, uh, we could do even better. And that would be good for all of Canada. So um, I, I hope people see the light. Great. Well, thank you very much again, Rick. And I, I like the attitude. That's part of what we want to see here is some positivity. You know, we're down, but not out. There's still opportunity. There's still a future. And that's why we're talking. That's why we've got these great panelists. That's why we're getting feedback from people. Don't hesitate to, to put questions in that scroll. And let's see what we can do with these resources we got, because it's not finished, even if some people want it to be and people feel it may be. I mean, we're, we're not done. So uh, an ongoing issue, and that has been, they, they've stopped our, our exports on so many levels. The Keystone XL managed to get shut down. Trans Mountain is, is hung up. Looks like it might go, it's hard to see. Northern Gateway is gone. Energy East uh, is uh, gone. Uh, line five is at risk. But there, we can think outside the box. The Alberta to Alaska rail line, that's an interesting one that popped out of the blue, a, a concept Absolutely. A product and, Absolutely. and a number of other such things. And another one, which we don't hear enough about, but we do have another coast that you just don't hear about that often. And that is uh, the one at Churchill to Hudson Bay. And, uh, you know, we wouldn't have to cross BC. We wouldn't have to cross Quebec. Some of these provinces that are a little hostile to having our products cross. I mean, they never have problems cashing our checks, but they don't like our pipelines for some reason. So this is another option. I mean, part of our problem is we just don't have enough of a customer base. I mean, we're in a terrible business position. It'd be like having a store with only one customer. Well, then your customer dictates your rates. We've got to get our product out to a broader base. So that's... Uh, Something, uh, and, and Pat there has also said, you know, would this put more, in, with Line 5 in peril, would it put more interest in building Energy East? I would say yes, except the government regulations haven't gone away that throttled Energy East in the first place. We still have that problem of having to get government out of the darn way. Though I think there'd be more support on the ground if, if people in Sarnia and such feel that, that terrible pressure that if that pipeline gets shut down. 